Ezra 9. I want to say this might be a short message, so be ready. It's probably going to be long, but <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it should be. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 9. Why don't you stand? I'll go ahead and read this chapter to you and then uh, maybe explain uh, some things that happened up, up to this uh, by way of just kind of... Uh, Given a recap, we keep on mentioning some of the th same things. It doesn't feel like we're getting very far because all these chapters are kind of dealing with this, but uh, we're moving ahead right now, uh, some important things, and then we'll be going into Nehemiah pretty quickly. All right, Ezra chapter 9. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, and this is Ezra talking, saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites, the Ammonites and the Moabites, the Egyptians and the Amorites. <clears throat> for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands." Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garments and my mantle and plucked out the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. You wonder why uh, pastors go bald and gray. Uh, this is probably why. They, and they go through a lot of clothes because they're renting their garments. At least that's what the Bible portrays. Uh, then uh, were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgressions of those that have been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord, my God and said, Oh, my God. I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our father have we been in great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face as, is this, as it is this day." And now, uh, for a little space, grace have been, has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail, a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath, hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants to the prophets, thy servants the prophets, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land, with the filthiness of the people of the land, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end of, uh, to another with their uncleanness. Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all the, that is come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that Thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and hast given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of this abominations? Uh, would, wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there shall be no remnant nor escape? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped. As it is this day, behold, we are before thee in our trespass, uh, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. God bless reading your word. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. And then it goes on here. I'm just reading the next two verses. 
You could be seated. You could be seated, though. Uh, now, when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great con congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land, yet now there is hope. In is uh, uh, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Okay, so right away we see that the children of Israel. Again, uh, another recap. I know it's a few weeks we've kind of gone over the same thing uh, in this, in, in, as far as telling this story. How about they come out of captivity? They're going back into the land, and then their enemies tried to stop their hand from building the city, and and I brought out a little bit this morning in the in the story of Esther, you know, how they're, they're trying to stop the Jews and they're kind of thinking of them as enemies. And so the work's definitely being stopped there. But then uh, they check the records, the kings go back and they say, yeah, Cyrus, you know, told them that this was the decree. And, and then King Artaxerxes makes another decree saying, hey, you know, don't stop this from happening. And, and you remember we preached, I preached about the laws of the, the, um, the laws of the king, and he says, if if anybody obeys not the laws of their God concerning this, and the laws of the king, you know, and, and, and they talk about how their houses are going to be torn down and turned into a dung hill and, and all this. So, man, these people uh, finally have their freedom and their liberty to get back to building, finishing the temple. So they're here. It's practically done. They're reinstating some of the practices and the sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. And instead, I mean, in, in, in an attempt to glorify God and to come and worship him and, and do all these practices, they take a look and the inventory of what's going on in the land. And the leaders, the princes, they come and they say, yeah, we got a problem here. You know, all of these, and these are the priests and the Levites. These are the guys that are supposed to be spiritual leaders. And they've all taken unto them wives of the land who have you know, turn, you know, they're worshiping other gods and all that. And this seems to keep coming up in the, in Israel. And, and we've got a big problem because they're mingling with the people. Okay. It says, uh, in, uh, uh, that their holy seed is mingled with the people of the land. And, and so I want to talk about that for a minute. The children of Israel, uh, have been told all throughout the law, you know, when they first left Egypt and they're wandering in the wilderness, they were told, don't go intermingle with the people of these lands. Now, uh, just like I said, uh, I can't remember if it was this morning or in Kansas City, but I, I, was just, I was just talking about how it's not, it doesn't have to do with skin color. You know, it doesn't have to do with race or where you're from. It's not like God's telling us to be prejudiced or, uh, you know, segregated. You know, that's not the issue. In fact, we see all throughout the Bible, uh, people from one race becoming Jews and converting to them and being married and even being in the line lineage of Christ. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was that these people in the lands that have these other beliefs and they're, they're still holding on to those and they have these wicked cultures and these wicked practices but these people were marrying and intermingling and it wasn't even a big deal in their minds. But now that they're being called to holiness and back to worshiping God, Ezra gets this information and he rents his garment as everybody seems to do when they're mad in the Bible, rips out his hair, <laughs> you know, it gets really upset about this and mourns and prays and, 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 uh, tries to get the mind of God because he's saying, we have messed up, man, we've sinned. When are we going to learn? You know, all the way back to our fathers in, the, in Egypt, basically, it just keeps on coming back to us not listening. Now, I'm not going to address it in this message, probably be in the next message or maybe after that. Um, I don't necessarily, and I've, I think I've mentioned this before at the beginning of the series, I don't necessarily think what he's going to institute in regards to everybody putting away their wives and, uh, and, and getting them out. I don't think that was the answer. I don't think God told them to do that. But what they're doing is trying to make the best they can out of this bad situation. What are we going to do now? We've sinned. We've taken them in to be our wives. And, and so we, we want the favor of God. And so they decide to put them away. 
you know, send them back to their homes or whatever it is. I don't necessarily think that's right because we understand how the Bible teaches about divorce and and all that. You know, maybe it maybe there was other way, ways they could have handled it, but that's not the scope of this message to kind of uh, decide that or to debate that. But what we want to see here is that idea of the fact that they were intermingled with the world, uh, with the people of those lands, how God felt about that, what the problems were. And, uh, and I want to talk about what that happens when God's people, what happens when God's people, the holy seed, if you will, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the promise about the, the seed, the holy seed is mingled with the people. Okay, now, when we go soul winning, a lot of times we'll meet people who claim to be born again, uh, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes I believe, I mean, by their testimony, they got saved when they were a kid, they, you know, maybe they had a family member that was a pastor in some cases, but then they start describing their life now, the person that they got married to, who's not a Christian or like part of a false, a false religion or something like that. And so I've asked point blank sometimes, well, you guys must not talk much about spiritual things then in the house. And they're like, no, we don't, because we don't want to fight and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, how could you as a Christian being saved, having the Holy Spirit within you, knowing that you're supposed to walk, like the Bible says, engage in a relationship with somebody who doesn't even believe those things and then not even talk about it. It's not like they're trying to convert the person. They just, you know, hey, we fight whenever we talk about it. So we're going to just live in a divided household, you know? And, and I suppose a lot of people are familiar with that. And maybe, you know, people, and maybe you got family members or maybe, uh, you know, in some time in your life or another, it's happened to you where somebody is just not thinking about that and they kind of fall in love with somebody or whatever the case. I was just talking about uh, in, in Kansas City, I was talking about the Song of Solomon. And of course it comes up how Solomon loved many strange wives and they, they directed his heart away from God to the point that, by the way, he even set up altars where they could sacrifice to all their gods. Now, it doesn't necessarily say that he did it, uh, but he set the altars up, so that's just as guilty. He took part in their evil deeds. And so it's a big problem, and, and I want to talk about some of the things um, that happen when we walk down that road. But first, let me give you two other examples in the Bible. Well, I already mentioned Solomon, so I'm just going to um, I'm just going to move on from that one. But go back to Genesis 4. And so Solomon, we understand, was that way. God was very upset with him in 1 Kings 11 because uh, he loved many strange wives and they took his heart away from following God wholeheartedly. And it, we seem to indicate, it, it seems to indicate that in the end of his life, he kind of got back to following the Lord and the end of Ecclesiastes seems to show that. <clears throat> but how about Genesis chapter four? Now, again, in Genesis chapter three, this is one chapter before this story we're going to read. Uh, this is where the famous prophecy is given that says, uh, I will put enmity, this is verse 15 of chapter 3, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He's, talk, he's talking to Satan. He says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, now look at chapter 4, verse 26. Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. And to Seth, now Cain kills Abel, and now God's going to give Adam and Eve another son who is Seth. And it says, to Seth, uh, to him also there, were bo there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So if you're following this out, Cain went his own direction, killed Abel. Now he's a castaway. And he's roaming about a uh, vagabond and, and uh, he's got Mark upon him, uh, you know, to protect him. But anyway, and, and now God is, is dealing through Seth, this godly line, this godly seed, if you will, which ultimately still, and, uh, you know, after Noah and the ark and everything, still ends up being the line from which Abraham comes and then later David and then uh, Christ, of course. 
But what we see here is it's, it's talking about Seth and his family and his lineage. It says they began to call upon the Lord. Okay, these are believers. These are whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the Bible says in the New Testament. Well, it's always been that way. It's always faith in the person that fears God, calls upon God. Uh, these people are saved. And so as you follow the lineage you go uh, of this godly seed, you go one chapter forward into chapter 4. In verse 20, uh, I mean, uh, uh, chapter 2, chapter, sorry, chapter 6. And it says, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, some people have come to this, this uh, conclusion I don't know how the original person that came up with this idea got there, but because it's usually taught, they've come up to, the, to this understanding that the sons of God here are referenced to angels. Now, I, I know where they get that, but uh, if you read the story, it doesn't make context that it, it, in the context, it doesn't make sense that it could be talking about angels. But here it says that the sons of God, I think it's clear that these are talking about those, that lineage of Seth. By the way, all of chapter five here is going through that line. And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And, uh, and Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. And, and it just keeps on going on. Uh, and then Enoch walks with God and he begat Methuselah. And all this goes up into the line of Noah. Okay, so this is a godly seed, the godly line lineage of Noah. And it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, right, scattered upon the face of the earth. And they took of them wives of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Okay, and I believe that's a reference to a uh, hundred and twenty years before the flood is going to happen, which we find that being the case. Uh, it also could be that eventually his lifespan is not going to be greater than a hundred and twenty. I've heard it taught that way. So then in verse 4, and if you're familiar at all with this teaching, a lot of people say, well, because the angels cohabited with the, with the son, with the daughters of man, it developed this race of people of giants, you know, and, and, uh, and it's, it's a really bizarre teaching. I don't, I don't want to get into that entirely right now, but I want to come from the perspective because I really believe that what it's talking about is the godly line looking upon the face of the earth and saying, hmm, let's see which women do we want to choose. And they weren't concerned about following God. Their heart went after many strange women, like we see over and over happening with God's people. Okay, and so as a result, it says that there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So what does that have to do with the angels? Like, first of all, I don't believe angels can cohabit with with uh, have those kinds of relations with mankind, with womankind. But we do see that there are this giants and this mighty race and all that. And I think that all that's happening there is they're choosing out the best ones and they're deciding what's going to make them a mightier race. And they're making these affinities and these, and they're lining up with the other kingdoms or whatever, you know, to get, you know, their, uh, to their, their race or their people to prosper. Okay, and so these are the mighty people that are coming up with this. I don't believe there's any supernatural, hey, just because they're giants, like we could, we could breed a race of giants pretty quickly, right? If we just chose our marriages and, and put tall people with tall people and get the genetics to work that way. People do it with, of course, with other anim with animals and stuff uh, all the time. Okay, so God saw the wickedness of man, verse 5, uh, was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created with, uh, from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And again, Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, Shem ends up being the part of the lineage of Christ. And so God preserves that line. He preserves a remnant. 
But you see that even in that part of the Bible, early on, just first four chapters, we already have a case where God's people are intermingling with the lost people and it's causing all kinds of problems. And ultimately, God gets very upset at the wickedness that's going on and they're not turning to him. They're not seeking him. They're going about seeking these other gods and these other uh, beliefs. All right, so let me give you three things here that, um, that happen as a result of the intermingling of the Holy Seed and the people, as Ezra puts it. Number one, this weakens the light of the gospel. Okay, when God's people intermingle with the world, it, it weakens the light of the gospel. Now, think about how watered down Christianity is today. I mean, it means nothing if we knock on a door when we're soul winning and somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. It means nothing because we have no idea what they even mean by that. You know, we don't know if they're saved. We certainly don't know even if they're saved, if they're actually living and letting their light shine and living for the Lord. We don't know that because just by them saying they're a Christian doesn't mean anything. Like they don't have anything to lose. They could go to any number of churches that call themselves Christians that live however they want. I mean, go to the United Methodist Church and you'll find that they, uh, there is like no light <laughs> there, uh, you know. And, and so uh, it's, it's uh, nowadays at least. And it's been just, it's just incredible to think of what, come, what is, is labeled as Christianity today. Listen to a lot of the Christian music, quote unquote Christian music. And it's just like, how can you even recognize that from the world's music? There's no difference. Uh, the way Christians dress and the way that they conduct themselves. If you as a Christian stand up and say, hey, God's people ought to look different. They ought to come out from among them and be separate and not walk like that. They're going to say, well, you're just this uh, uh, legalistic, you know, you're, you're like a Pharisee. You're not a real Christian. And they're calling good evil and evil good. Like this is what the Bible says is going to happen. And this is where we are today. And of course, it's not new just to our generation, but that's the reality. As God, uh, uh, now get this, God, if he wanted to, I mean, he has the, he can do all things. And if he wanted to, he could just decide, you know, I'm just going to put into these people, hey, uh, this person's going to trust on me. This person's going to trust in me. This person's going to trust in me. And, and these people aren't going to trust in me, like kind of a Calvinistic idea. And he could just choose to do that, but he doesn't. We see in the Bible that he wants us to use our free will to choose him. And yet over and over, people reject him and people that, that even once chose him start walking back in the ways of the world and all this stuff. And it makes sense why it would make him upset because we are supposed to be the light of the world. And we're supposed to be shining his light and, and spreading that to the world. And when we intermingle with the world and we began to look more like the world, what we're doing is weakening the light of the gospel. Okay, let's go to uh, John chapter 1. You're familiar with this uh, passage, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. John chapter 1. <clears throat> John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness and darkness comprehended it not. All right. Then it goes and talks about John. The same came witness. Verse seven to bear uh, for a witness to bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe he, John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Okay, so these are the sons of God that we're talking about in, in uh, Genesis as well. These are the sons of God that are supposed to be shining the light, following the light, following God, spreading his word. And instead, we find Christians sometimes intermingling and being watered down. What did Jesus say in uh, Matthew 5? Uh, uh, I think that's 
I don't remember the right verse, but this exact verse, but he says a, a light, he says, you are the light of the world. And a, and a light on a, uh, on a hillside can't be, uh, you know, you, you, I, I guess we got to go there. Let's see, Matthew 5, 14. Let's just go there so I don't butcher it too much. Matthew 5, I know he talks about a candlestick and then he talks about a hillside. There's two different references there. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, so this light that we're shining is a reflection of God and His light uh, and give um, you know light to the world that they might believe in Jesus is what John talks about. Now go to John chapter 3. Popular passage of scripture here where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says in verse 17, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought, of, uh, wrought in God. All right, so here's the thing, the way that I take this passage. Um, you know, if you are saved... The reason you're saved is because you're not relying at all on your works to get you to heaven. What you're saying is, hey, let the light shine on me. I know I'm wicked. I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve to go to hell. Uh, but the righteousness uh, is, is God's righteousness. What's getting me to heaven is God. I want that to be seen. You know, but the person who's trying to hide and like the Pharisees, he's, he's addressing in many uh, cases here. The, the, the person that's trying to hide, he doesn't want to come to the light because he doesn't want his deeds to be seen. And he doesn't want to, uh, uh, you know, he wants to pretend like he's good and he's righteous and he's holy. But, you know, hey, if you're going to come to the light, you're going to be exposed. OK, it's not your light. It's his light that's going to be shining. But when people meet up with the world who's who, who's who likes to hide their sin and and all that, then then what we do is we're polluting we're diluting that light and. Here's the thing, the darkest, you, you've, you've heard this illustration, in the darkest night, the light shines the brightest. Have you ever heard that? And so therefore, you know, whenever it's kind of dusk, you know, I, sometimes I'm driving around, I got my headlights on, and it's like, man, it's just that weird time of the day where it doesn't seem like the headlights even brightened anything up. It's like really not doing any good. But on a pitch black night, you know, I know you can't see the moon in the, in the sky or anything like that. Man, your light just shines like crazy. You know, it can really be seen. And you've probably heard that analogy, like in this world, when it's really wicked, the Christians who are living for God are going to just stand out, the, you know, like a sore thumb, just going to, uh, everybody's going to, you know, see them because they're so much different from the world. All right, but what happens is, as that light dims and you become darker and darker and darker, well, you're not shining your light <laughs> like you're supposed to. So this is what happens when God's people mingle with the world. It confuses uh, the world. It, 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 when we embrace the world, it's, it's confusion and it's, uh, it's ineffective at, at, reach, at you know, sending out the gospel. Now, it's not to say that somebody who's not living for the Lord like they should can't still preach the gospel and get people saved. I understand that they can. But it's like God wants you to shine your light. He wants people to see your good works. He wants to see you living a separated life. He doesn't want us to just get as close to the world as we can, acting like them, and then be like, oh, yeah, by the way, like, you, yeah, you can just continue in your sin and everything and still be saved. Is that true? It is true. But God's not wanting you to preach that message. He's wanting you to say, hey, get saved, and then you can, be, uh, you can live like a Christian as well and bring glory and honor to God. Look at James chapter 4. The second point of this, to continue that thought, is it weakens the light of the gospel. And this, it angers God. The second point is it angers God 
and it puts you at enmity with him. Now, who is dumb enough to want to be an enemy of God? <laughs> but yet there's a lot of people who, there are a lot of people who are the enemy of God. James chapter 4, verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I remember a guy... Uh, in Kansas City when we started that work and and he came to me one day and, and he was just really studying his Bible and trying to figure things out and he said do you think I could be an enemy of God and it's just wheels were just turning and he's just the thought of how, how could I ever be an enemy of God and I was like well the Bible says that you can be if you're living in the world and you're being like the world it says that you're at enmity with God it doesn't mean you're not going to be saved right this flesh is what we're talking about. We're not talking about the spirit, but this flesh, as long as you're alive in this earth, if you're living like the world and you're not letting your light shine, you are at enmity with God. And the children of Israel who were mingling with the, the wicked people in the different lands, you know, giving over to uh, all types of lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and pride of life and all that's in the world. And, uh, and, and it's, it caused anger all the way throughout the Old Testament caused anger, and, and obviously it still happens in the New Testament, to God. Um, so remember the prophecy that was given when we went through the study on the kings, and we talked about Jehoshaphat and Ahab. You know, one from the northern kingdom, one from the southern kingdom. Ahab is, Ahab is from the northern kingdom. And they kind of made an alliance. The Bible says they made an affinity, which, by the way, that's the same word... Uh, uh, that was used here in our in our text um, that they made an affinity with the world, and so uh, they made an affinity. They made an alliance, and in Second Chronicles nineteen, it says that. Uh, uh, well, let's just go Second Chronicles nineteen. Really strong words here from a prophet who, from all we can see, Jehoshaphat seemed like a pretty decent guy. But God sends a prophet to go speak to him because he's upset with him because he's made an alliance with, um, with Ahab, which obviously Ahab's biggest problem was probably Je uh, Jezebel, his wife, which, there you go again, hooked up with uh, the world and ended up Jezebel causing all kinds of problems. Second Chronicles chapter 19, look at verse 2. And Jehu, the son of Han Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is the wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Here's a clear example where loving the world is enmity with God. How could you be, a, be uh, this is what he's saying here, is how could you... Uh, Love them that hate the Lord. How could you help the ungodly? Make an affinity. Help them like you're basically being partaker of their evil deeds. And he's like, how can you do that? Like you're going to serve me. You need to separate yourself from that or else God's going to be mad at you. And this is what Jehu tells uh, King Jehoshaphat. Now, I'm going to, the last point has to do with our children. Okay, this uh, mixing, mingling the seed with the people of the world destroys, it brings destruction to our children. But I want to reiterate that one of the things that happened when Jehoshaphat lined up with Ahab and they made an affinity, we see in the Bible that Ahab's daughter, how shall I, what is it? Athaliah, uh, she paid better attention than I did and I was preaching the thing. Athaliah, uh, they made an affinity and, and Ahab gave Athaliah to Jehoshaphat's son to marry, which ends up doing the same thing Jezebel did and causing all kinds of sins in the southern kingdom. And so, so you know what? This is what happens when you intermingle with the world. And I'm not talking about just marriage, obviously. I'm talking about just yoking up with the world. But this is the application here that our children are going to be destroyed. Now, naturally, it's going to, uh, our sins and things we do are going to make an effect, have an effect on our children. Okay, uh, 
you know, I, I, remember, I remember in Bible college, you know, there'd be occasionally somebody who'd walk away from it all, uh, claim to not believe it anymore or whatever, and, and live like the world and stuff. And, and you know what, you watch their kids and you're like, those kids had every opportunity. These people were in the word, they were training up their children, homeschooling them, teaching them the Bible. But then when the parents decided to walk away or they started getting these friends or their family members who were talking them out of this and, and they just kind of gave it up and started living like the world, do you think their kids continued to serve the Lord? Of course not. The kids, they, and some of them might not have even been saved yet. Now what happened? You know, they never, they, they maybe never even got saved. And so, uh, so it's a real problem. It's a, it's an, it naturally affects children when their parents live in sin or intermingle with the world. And uh, I preached a message on this before, but it, uh, uh, it, the Bible says in a few places, even unto the third and fourth generation. Okay, and so like it's going to affect the next generation, probably going to affect the next generation after that. And then hopefully it'll come back around, you know, and if someone does good, then that'll affect their generations, their future generations as well. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing when a Christian walks away from God or it gets too close to the world and the influences of the world. And so I'll give you a couple examples here. Um, you know, you hear me hit on it a lot, but like the public schools, for instance, like let's say someone stops serving the Lord and uh, stops con being concerned about even homeschooling and separating from the world. And, and, and by the way, this is one of the things whenever somebody starts walking away from the Lord, uh, their kids are always end up in public school because they're like, well, I don't see the problem. Like, you know, uh, all this time, you know, we've been holding back our kids from excelling and all that. And we've been harming our kids. And so because they're not thinking spiritually, they're thinking in the, in the lust of the flesh. And so they're like, let's let our kids go to public school over and over and over. We got testimonies where we can see where these two, even pastors, kids just totally went away from the Lord, not even recognizable as Christians, probably claim uh, to be atheists or whatever because of the fact that they just were allowed to go intermingle with the kids at the public school and in, endure in, in, in the philosophies that are taught by the public school teachers and curriculum and all that. I'm not saying they're all bad, uh, but who wants to trust the, the ways of the world? The God of this world, little G, is Satan. You know, and, and we don't want our kids to be influenced by that and to be given over to uh, uh, to that stuff. Okay, the other thing is the uh, uh, the kids are around the rel the 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 worldly relatives, the ones that are drinking and the ones that are cussing and the ones that are living promiscuous and and all that. Hey, when the person stops seeking God and stops separating from God, and they start intermingling with that. Those kids are going to be under the influence of those of those, you know, family members who are aren't living for the Lord. <clears throat> those kids are going to be under the influence of friends that come over and party and all that stuff. Those kids pick all of that up. And it just goes and it affects them. And before you know it, they're living like the world and they're destroyed and they don't know why. You know, why am I uh, enduring all this suffering? Well, it's because your parents quit living for the Lord and your parents walked away and they let you just intermingle with the world. And this is what happens. They start being influenced by all the entertainment of the world. Look, we, you know, in my house, like just to be totally honest with you, oh, I know that the entertainment Sometimes reading books, wa uh, watching TV shows or whatever, uh, it it's oftentimes gets a little too close to just totally like saturating ourselves in worldliness. Okay, now at least we, tr we are consumed enough with following the Lord and, and spiritual things that we at least, you know, are kind of guiding. Let's say we're watching a show and something bad happens, like then there's talk about like, oh, that's awful. And they shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain or they something. And then we're, and we're preaching it with our lips. That's at least something. But you know what? We have been guilty many times about letting our kids endure these philosophies, these teachings, influences and entertainment and such from the world. And you say, oh, come on, let your kids live. You mean let them be destroyed because they're intermingling with the world? That's, a, that's not what I want for my kids. I want them to uh, continue to be the holy seed, 
Continue to be the godly, calling on the Lord, following the Lord, and not be destroyed. But ultimately, you have, uh, again, if the, it, let's say that I start, or let's just go a step further. Let's say my kids grow up, and there was maybe some weakness there. They began to seek the things of the world, and then they say, like, you know what? I'm not going to live the Christian life my parents lived. You know, this happens, by the way, to a lot of preacher's kids where they say, like, hey, I saw the stress of ministry. I saw the hardship. I saw some of the things. I don't want anything to do with ministry. You know, I hope that never happens. My kids don't have to be preachers. I don't, I've never tried to push them or work, you know, get them into like full time ministry, but they need to be serving the Lord with all their heart. They need to be in church. They need to be loving their families and raising a godly offspring. That's what I want for my kids. But, you know, let's say they, raise, they, they grow up and they don't have a mind to do that. And they just say, you know what? I'm just not interested in that. Yes, I'm still saved, but I don't want to live that lifestyle. I don't want to go down that road. Well, what are the chances that they're going to intermingle with the world and going to give up on that whole Christian thing and, and intermingle with the world? Maybe they still got, you know, they know that they're saved and they're not denying that, but their, their kids aren't going to have the, be under the same preaching. They're not going to be taught the same way because I don't want to push them because, you know, I didn't like it whenever my parents pushed me or whatever. So eventually that gospel line is just going to be cut off. And there's going to be a generation who knows not the Lord because of the fact that, you know, wherever you can start with me or you can start with my kids decided to intermingle. That's the Holy seed intermingling with the people of the lands. Okay, and it's going to weaken the light of the gospel. It's definitely going to anger God, and it's going to bring destruction upon the children and probably just cut off a generation altogether of people who could be working for the Lord, bringing honor to the Lord, seeing souls saved, and all that, all because we didn't want to separate from the Lord. So you can see why Ezra then is upset. Because he's known that he knows that this cycle has just repeated itself over and over since the Garden of Eden. You know, I was saying since the children of Israel came out of Egypt, no, since the Garden of Eden, this has been man's uh, mindset and his bent towards sin. Okay, now we're all going to sin and we all have human flesh, but man, we need to fight it. We really need to try to separate ourselves from the world. Now, I understand we live in this world. We have to work in the world. Uh, you know, we can't go out of this world and, and not experience any visuals or anything like that. Uh, we understand that. But what we can do is make sure the people we choose to be around and the people we fellowship with and the people we have over for dinner and all that kind of stuff are people that are going to help us serve the Lord and we're going to help them serve the Lord. And, uh, and we don't want to be intermingled with the people of this world. It's all throughout the Bible and I've hit on it before, but here it is again in Ezekiel chapter 9. So uh, we need to be reminded of it once again. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. We know that our human flesh wants to go against you in many ways. And, and, uh, and we, we miss sometimes the mark of, of what you expect from us and what you want us to do. And we go our own way, and we are so thankful, Lord, that you um, are knowledgeable of that, and you understand uh, that we are flesh, and you understand that without your intervention, Lord, we would all just die and go to hell. So thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus um, to die for us, and, I, and Lord, help us who have trusted in him for our salvation to seek to serve him with our lives and be a strong, bright light to the world that they might see our good works and glorify God. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just help us continue to teach uh, future generations, our children and grandchildren, to honor you and to love you and to not be intermingled with the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.